What's up? This is Seth Mosley. You're with us on the Made It Music Podcast, and we've got a really good one today. We've got Joey Elwood of Goatee Records. He is an absolute legend in the music space and uh, A&R, helping run the label, brand management, all of the above. You're going to learn so much for this, as I know I am too. But before we jump in, quick announcement about our Facebook group. If you want community support, and a group to share your music with, we created a group for you. You can go to fullcirclemusic.com slash group to check it out. If you're new to the group, request an invite, or if you've already been a member for a while, share a new song. This is the best way for our team to have a chance to see what you guys are up to, so make sure to go to fullcirclemusic.com slash group to join in. All right, Joey Elwood, thanks so much for being on the Made It Music podcast with us today. No oh, man, it's, it's an honor to be here, buddy. And and legend is just uh, just another word for old. <laughs> well, that's not entirely true. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'd I'd love to just rewind. I, I want to hear your I want to hear your story just out of being a fan of you and who you are. What was the moment when music first influenced you in a way that made you know that you wanted to be a part of the industry in a professional way? Uh, in a professional way, it, it kind of snuck up on me, to be honest with you. Uh, it, it, uh, I, it, I would love to tell you right now there was this grand orchestrated plan for me to be in the music industry, but it wasn't that way at all, Seth. I, I kind of tripped into it. Uh, I think nepotism played into it uh, quite a bit. Uh, but also, I think it was a little bit of timing and, um, you know, uh, the person who drug me into the business was I, my cousin and I grew up with him and we loved music. We would spend every New Year's Eve together and listen to the countdowns. And, you know, we just, we go to the, we go to places in DC and listen to hip hop when it was first coming out and go, go and stuff like that. So, but being in the business, I think, I think it kind of came, uh, it was maybe plan C, maybe plan D. Um, that's not a very sexy answer, but that's my answer. <laughs> that's fair enough. Well, I mean, how did it happen? Um, so I, so I got, I went to school at a school called George Washington and I got out and I started working at a bank. Uh, I was in trust, I was in trust doing trust work. And, uh, about a year into it, I realized, Oh no, I've made a tragic mistake. I got to get out of this, you know? And my parents were like, are you crazy? And I was like, no, I, I think I was crazy doing <laughs> what I was doing. And I, you know, I was talking to my cousin uh, one, one uh, Thanksgiving when, I, when he came home from Nashville. He had just gotten a record deal. And, and uh, he said, man, I said, hey, I think I'm going to quit my job. And he said, won't you just come down and spend a couple of weeks with me or a month or so with me as you transition? So I did that. And I ended up staying for a year. And then I went to New York and I came back in 91 to Nashville and I and, and honestly, I think I basically was following the vision of my cousin because uh, uh, I didn't have one at that point in my life. I was I was still pretty aimless, and um, and he it was it was you know I, I'm glad I kind of bet on him because it was it was a good bet, and it was, yeah. And, and, and maybe clarify for the listeners who don't know out there who who is your cousin? Uh, it's it's Toby McKeon. Okay. Toby Mack, as, as many know him. So obviously he was getting a record deal. When did goatee become a thing? Like, was that sort of right around that same time or, you know, there's obviously the DC talk era of things. Um, Maybe, maybe tell us about the beginnings of of goatee and how, how that all happened. So, so Toby got his deal like around 89 or 88, maybe. And I, I came to town in 90 and then came back in the end of 91, beginning of 92. And uh, Toby just had this vision because he was out on the road. And he kept saying, guys, because we kind of were a production company. Uh, me, Toby, and a guy named Todd Collins. We were just in the studio, you know, producing some stuff. And he said, man, I'm meeting a lot of kids out there that are pretty good. And maybe we should sign one and just make a record and see if we can get it signed. I mean, maybe we should sign a band to a production deal and see if we can, we can get it signed to a label. So we ran into this, this girl group called out of Eden through a, a, another producer friend of ours. And we produced a few songs and we took it around town. And there were a few people interested for sure, but 
I, I, it was a little bit of us, you know, going, oh no, I don't know if this is going to work if we hand it to somebody else because they were three girls who were doing R and B and there really wasn't a market for R and B music and Christian music. So I think we just kind of said, let's just try it ourselves. And, and that was really naive. And we did it, we did it pretty much the, the, the complete wrong way, but we got lucky and it, and it got kind of sticky and, um, and it just, we got enough reinforcement to make another song and then make another song and finally make an album and then make another album with them. And uh, yeah, that, that's the, the uh, abridged version, but that's, that's how it kind of happened. It, it uh, was three, three producer guys that were, and I was, I was more on the business end of the production. Uh, we, we were just trying to get a band signed. Yeah. So you were, you, you went into it from a, yeah, from a producer mentality you mentioned that you kind of did things the completely the wrong way. What do you mean by that, knowing what you know now? Well, we started off by borrowing money to start a company, uh, it, which isn't the ideal scenario to start a company. Uh, but, you know, the good news is nobody gave us too much because if they would have given us too much, we probably would have burned through it pretty quick. But, you know, they gave us just enough and it caused us to still kind of, you know, be a little hungry and get on our grind. And really, it was mostly about just, you know, ideas and we couldn't throw money at a lot of problems. So, you know, it, it, you don't want to start with a loan, but the good news is nobody gave us a lot of money. So that was that was mistake number one, probably. And then from there, you know, I did the first probably year of royalty statements on my own. <laughs> Cause I didn't know, I didn't know there was companies that actually did royalties. So and there, there was just a bunch of operational stuff that we get, we just kind of like, you know, and sending some, sending these three girls out on tour by themselves when they were 12, 15 and 17 was probably not a great idea either. So <laughs> that's just, a, that's just a start, Seth. I can, we can go on forever. All the mistakes we made to go to. <laughs> well, no, that's, it, it's good to hear because people look at it nowadays and see what it is, but you know, did definitely didn't always start out that way. So obviously out of Eden, that was kind of the launching point. It, yeah. You know, you went on to have some massive success with, with artists like Sonic Flood, Failing Force 5, you know, Reliant K, who I was a big fan of growing up. Um, can you talk maybe about how did you, you know, what, what was the process for sort of building, building the label out? Was it just one artist introduced you to another one or like, how, how did you kind of go about um, building it to be the competitive entity that it has been for so long? Uh, I, I think, you know, as far as getting artists on, it always came from relationships. You know, it'd be somebody like you would say, Hey, uh, you know, we, I, I got this artist that came into town riding with and, or it'd be another, it'd be another artist or somebody Toby met on the road. Uh, really always came through relationships. Um, and we were, we were just so thrilled that people wanted to work with us that we didn't say no enough at the beginning that we, sh and, and we should have, you know, we, you know, we had some success early and our growth, our, you know, it wasn't like this rocket ship growth, but for, for us, it felt like a rocket ship growth. And, um, and, you know, we probably should have said no a lot more, but we just kept signing people who said, yeah, I'll work with you. And we're like, really? Okay. And I, I know that sounds ridiculous and juvenile, but it was pretty ridiculous and juvenile because we were just, like I said, thrilled that people were like saying yes to us. And uh, that's how we kind of built it out. And we, and we just got fortunate because some of those did pretty well. Yeah. And you know, in those, in those beginning years, I mean, knowing what I know now, when, when there's a hot band that comes to town and then, you know, one A&R person gets excited about them and then everybody sort of jumps on them, how are you kind of making yourself competitive as a small, uh, as a small label? Honestly, there weren't too many bands that we signed that other labels were after, to be, to be brutally honest. I, I remember we were at a distribution company at one time and they're like, how come you guys aren't involved in this one meeting with this one artist? And my answer was, well, you don't want us there. You want us to where, because that's where you are. You want us where the people aren't. And, uh, and there are only a few times where we were competing with the bigger labels, to be honest with you. In hindsight, has that ever felt like a bit of a risk? Like, or, or do you just, you know, when you find something you like, I act on it, jump on it before anybody else can kind of get to it. Like, what, what's your mentality with that? 
about about who who do we sign or what kind of risk to take or both? Yeah, like you know, when when everybody's interested in something, it doesn't always mean that it's amazing. You know, there's many times there's there's bidding wars over people, and it it still doesn't end up working. Yeah, but when you know when there's not a lot of enthusiasm around an artist per se it could be perceived as okay well they're they're going out and taking a risk and i guess every signing is a risk in 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 that standpoint but um the long way around of asking that question is what point you know do do, do you feel or have you felt over the years ready to over overcome that hurdle like you're an investor you're you're going to invest time you're investing a slot on your label you're investing yeah. um bandwidth you obviously have to have some semblance of, you know, okay, well, th- this is going to be worth the risk for that. Yeah. So what makes you, what, 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 like, what is it about an artist that sort of pushes you over the edge to, to make that step? To be really honest with you, I, I would say 9.999 times out of 10, I rely totally on when it comes to this issue uh, on Toby's instinct. Uh, Toby's got super good instincts on uh, music, but I, I think his one of his superpowers is his instincts on people and like their work ethic and their if they have a vision. Uh, uh, he kind of can see. He's pretty good at seeing what people's potential is mm. uh, better than most. I think I, I'm. I'm not quite as good at that as he is. And so I defer to that. And if Toby goes, I have a strong instinct. I'm like, all right, just tell me, that, let's get going. Let's go. Yeah. How long does it take him to develop that about somebody? Man, he's slow. I mean, when I say slow, I don't mean that in all the bad ways. I mean, but Toby, Toby, I mean, we have to sit down with artists early and go, this is going to be a two to two and a half year process with you. And if that's not fast enough, we totally understand. Um, and and we don't want to frustrate you and uh this isn't we're not being slow because we are we're we're just lazy or we don't really want to get to it we're being slow because we think there's one introduction and and part of that two and a half year uh slow run up to it is you know maybe six six to eight months of toby going meeting the person talking to them making sure his instinct is right finding new questions to ask them to see if they were performing for him or if that was really their character. It was a little bit of all that, you know? Hmm. So, so when you say a two to two and a half year process, is that like once you, between when you meet them and when you sign them or like actually putting out music and like getting them released? It's usually Toby meets them and the music comes out. It's somewhere in a two and a two to two and a half year process. We've, but we've done it faster uh, and we've maybe done a little slower, but I think that's the more than normal for us is that that time frame. Well, that, that that's a great answer. This is a super small small question, but how did you how did you guys come up with a name originally? This is mm-hmm. backtracking a bit. No, no, I think everybody. I mean, I think me and Toby have a little bit different memory on this, or maybe it's a combination of the two. But when I came back from New York, uh, uh, I think goatees were just kind of in. And so uh, Mark Heimerman, who was a producer back then, uh, you know, our production team, me, Todd and Toby, we all had goatees. And he would say, oh, hey, man, just call the goatee brothers. Or here come the goatee brothers. Or he would laugh at us, you know, and uh, it just kind of stuck. So our production company became the goatee brothers. And we misspelled it on purpose because we knew we didn't want to be facial hair for if if this ended up lasting longer than a year. We didn't want to be we wouldn't we didn't want to be facial hair. So. (laughs) I love that. That's a great, great story. The Goatee Brothers. And um, yeah, so fast forwarding to today, I know you do a lot of things. It's it's a lean and mean label, but can you maybe sum it up? What what do you do on a day to day? Like what is what is Joey Elwood at Goatee look like on a day to day level? Well, I'm not involved that much in the in the creative side that much anymore. Probably about maybe as much as eight to ten years ago. I realized that um, I, I love my taste in music. I really do, but I, I don't really know what an 18 to 25 year old likes. And, that, and that's our target audience. So I, I kind of slipped into the operational role. And, you know, also 
I try to, you know, talk to the guys and girls here and just say, Hey, you know, might want to think about this, this, you know, just that might, you know, I know this person you're getting ready to talk to. So a little mentoring going on, but it really, for me is operational. It's, you know, it's contracts, it's the finances, it's the royalties, you know, it's the daily operation. It's the, you know, the relationships in the industry trying to get us uh, some relational capital and some, just some, you know, easing into some opportunities if we can. So that, that's, that's the main thing I do. And that speaks volumes to you as an operational leader, the fact of what you guys are able to accomplish with such a small team. I think you were telling me before we started recording, is it, is it five people right now? Yeah, just five of us. So how do you, how do you do that? I mean, you've got all these artists, you've got this uh, side brand management business, which I, I do want to talk about, but how, how do you get such a high output out of such a small team? Talent, really. I mean, I mean, you know, the two brand managers we have, uh, Brad Moist and, and uh, Jess, Jess Chambers, they both have been in the industry for close to 20 years. And, you know, we try to pay them, you know, a, like a, a better than fair wage. And we want to reward them for being great at what they do. So, you know, somebody, people like that can, they can do a lot, you know, and, and they also have the personality where they want to do a lot as well. Um, because they love touching all sides of the business. They don't want to just do one thing. So, and then the other two guys in our office are just really super smart, super talented. And we're just, we're lucky. We're just really lucky because we really do probably more, our, our guys, they, you know, they, they work way more than 40 hours a week for sure. But almost everybody does in our business. I would, I'd say your company's probably the same. We tr- I mean, we've tried to keep it pretty normal hours, you know, maybe, maybe to a fault. I don't know. <laughs> Smart. Smart. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a weird business, but, and there are definitely exceptions and there are seasons, but that's, 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 uh, that's good to hear you say that. Yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit more towards the artist side. So which of these scenarios happens more often that an artist approaches you asking about a record deal or you discover an artist on your own and, and, and you guys approach them? It's probably, and I wouldn't say we discover it on our own. It's just, like I said, somebody brings an artist to us and says, I'm working with this artist. I wrote with this artist. I'm managing this, this indie artist. Uh, they, they bring them to us. Um, and that's how the process starts with us almost exclusively, to be honest with you. Gotcha. So, Goatee's had had a really good track record for artist development for breaking new artists. What is the artist development process look like from your standpoint? Uh, I think first and foremost is trying to find you know early on Toby's kind of testing their metal with questions and you know just you know saying you know seeing if how well they take like not maybe I guess criticism you know like uh, that song's good but it could be better how do they respond to that and uh um so that's the beginning of it is kind of some i I don't want to know if it's character issues but it's more like um what's their motor what's their motor and what's their motivation like why do they want to do this and what are they doing it for so that kind of starts it for us uh and then from there it's it's giving it space and time so that each the moment you're looking for really is because you gave it a moment before. So if there's six moments in an artist's career, there's the moment before the moment that you really want to give, you want to give space for, you know, and that's what we, that's what we try to do in artist development is give that space. Gotcha. So thinking about, cause, cause yeah, that, that's a really important point that you just hit on is a lot of people associate artist development, um, with, you know, you got to get your website together. You got to build your social media. You got to figure out your sound. But a lot of what you're talking about really is just like heart, mission, mindset. What, what, what is the, the core of what this whole thing's about? And I think, um, like how do, how, if you were, if you were talking to a new artist, who's literally just trying to figure their thing out, I mean, how, how do they discover that process? Is that something that it can be coached? Is that something that, somebody just kind of has to have. Um, I think we've seen it both ways at Goatee. We've seen people who are just natural. They just have this instinct for 
for kind of having a vision and starting it and knowing how to finish it or finish finish or finding things that they need to start and then finishing them. Because most people are either good finishers or good starters, but very rarely are they good at both. Some people have it and some people have to learn it. Um, but I, you know, at some point, if you, if a person just is one or the other, it, uh, it, it, it usually falls apart. It's, it's been our experience. So in a, in a new artist scenario, really people have to develop the skill of not only starting things, but finishing, yeah. um, or, you know, I guess you probably see this in bands, right? Like maybe one of the band members is is really that that driving force, that business force, and then the other one's like the creative ideas guy. Is that is that often the case? Yeah. I mean, I, there's one thing I learned from an old guy when I first got here. I was really discouraged one time, and he sat me down on a napkin, and he, sh- he said to me, man, there's three things in every successful business. And sometimes it can be two people. And it can be three people, but it can never be one person. That's the tragic mistake most people make is you got to have a designer, a developer, and a manager. And a designer, uh, three quarters of the way through their prototype, they abandon it and they go on to the next idea. The developer is sitting there going, okay, here's six of the ideas that the designer has come up with. I'm going to develop two of these. And they spend three to four years on developing the idea, then they abandon it for the next development. And then the manager is sitting there and they ring out every single possibility from what's been designed, developed and managed. And it's not as fluid as that because you have a lot of things in the matrix happening all at one time, but those, those mindsets have to be in any business, whether it's a band or a company, those three lanes have to be attended to. Uh, And so I think a band knowingly and unknowingly sometimes will have those three roles, the ones that are successful um, the designer, the developer, and the manager. And, um, yeah, it's great. great yeah. strategy, but it, sometimes it just happens. Well, that's such a great way to look at it. And I want to, I want to dive more into that. How, how would you explain those roles in a, in an artist scenario? Like what, what, who's the designer? What does the designer do in, 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 in the music business? Who's the developer? What does the developer do? Manager might be self-explanatory because there are artist managers, but can you can you maybe clarify how those apply in the music business? Because that's such a great framework. I've never heard heard it put that way before. I mean, Seth, it changed me. Honestly, it changed me when the guy sat me down and talked to me about it. Because I, I I began to understand people better. I, I I would not get frustrated with a designer when they didn't know how to manage their idea. Yeah, and, and then you all of a sudden you start you start uh, marginalizing people. Like, oh, oh my gosh, I can't believe you don't you can't do this. You know. Um, but it's, it's really important to, to not start, if you forget what people are good at and only judge by what they're not good at, then all, all the possibility that's potentially there just goes away, you know? But, you know, to go back to the design developer manager thing, like, like, an idea, like in a band, let's say, designers tend to be people who, they're, they're not great finishers, but they have finishers around them, you know? But they have more ideas and they're throwing them out all the time, almost without regard for how does this get done? It's almost like blue. They walk in the room sometimes. It's not this extreme, but like blue and they walk out, right? <laughs> you don't know if it's light blue. You don't know if it's dark blue. You don't know if it's indigo. They just go blue. And, you're, and everybody's like scrambling, like, what, what does that mean? You know? But then there's somebody in the room that goes, hold on a second. That's a really good idea. That's a good idea. Hold on. Now, what we need to do, we need to do step one, two, three, and four to start that idea. We need to get this person involved. You know, it's almost like somebody walks by, they, 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 they go to an empty field and go, you know what? There's going to be a highway come through here soon. And they walk out of the room. And then somebody goes, you know what? They're right. And over here is where we got to put a gas station. And the way we're going to do it, we got to go to the city hall. We got to make sure there's an intersection here. And they start going into like how to make it happen. And then when it happens, the manager makes sure that the gas station is the right gas station on the right side of the road, you know, and doing every, it's, it, it kind of, it, it gets finished well, you know. Um, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's an okay example of what that can look like, you know. Yeah, so, so the designers are the ideas people. I, I liked how you said that, that w- without regard for how does this get done. Yeah. Um, 
the developer, they, they take the raw materials of those ideas, whatever those are, maybe it's an idea for a, a, a song or an album or a music video or a tour, and they, they flesh it out. Is, it, is that kind of a good way of saying it? Yeah, I think they, they give it, they give it uh, viability. They give it life. They give it life beyond just the breath of, of creativity. They turn it from an idea into something tangible. That's right. And, and then the manager, is, is that the artist manager or is that just kind of like it could be somebody in the band? Could be somebody in the band. I mean, a lot of times it is somebody in the band. Uh, uh, but the best managers, uh, you know, that, now here's the problem in most companies. This guy told me when, he, when he's giving me this solution, giving me this, uh, this kind of grid, he said the problem in all companies is that the designer uh, does not want to ever be in the room with the managers and the managers don't trust the designers. So it's somebody's job in that company at some level to, to teach and make sure that the room plays nice and that everybody respects each other. Like, Hey guys, just remember, we can't, we don't have a job without this role. So everybody is respecting each other's role because if you leave it to natural like selection, like Darwinism, Lord of the flies, you, the people who love chaos want to get all the order out of the room as fast as possible. And the yeah. people who love order want all the chaos out of the room as fast as possible. And so it's real important that somebody in, in, in probably your developer who can appreciate both order and chaos and can merge the two. So the developer holds the two together. basically. I, I think so. I think that's, yeah. yeah. That's so good. And I'm just thinking through my mind of like all the artists that I've worked with over the years and how that's pretty much played out to a T. <laughs> if, if, you, if at Apple, when Apple first started, that, that, was in, that was in play. Almost any, any company or anything that you have, order and chaos are always vying for, there's a tension inside of ideas between those two forces. Man, that's such, that's such a good framework. Um, so de designer, developer, manager. So, so would you say to, to a new artist, um, first thing would be to find out who you are, right? In that, in that sort of framework. Um, obviously that can be as simple as, you know, survey the people around you, <laughs> which one of these three do I sound the most like, you know, and then obviously try to um, find people to support you who can kind of fill those other roles. Well, and, and, and this is what can, can confuse it more is that I'll take my, I mean, I, I, I think I'll say this with some clarity uh, at my, at my house, at home, I think I'm pretty much a manager <laughs> at work. I'm a developer, but I have a side of me that is a designer. So it's not like people are static, but in a certain environment, you probably are going to naturally fall into one of those lanes, you know, uh, and like, I'm not a great designer, but I like to design. So I'm in a, in a, in a business, in a place where you have to make money, I'm never going to fall into the design lane. Uh, but I like to design. So I, I don't want to say that people can't be a designer if they're a manager at their company. It's just probably if you want to make money, you might not want to be the designer if that's not your natural inclination. How, how and when in your process did you kind of discover that? Just, I'm just thinking in terms of putting, my, putting myself in the, the new artist's shoes. How, 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 the quicker they can to figure out who they are, the better, right? Oh, yeah. And, and that's super hard. I got a 22-year-old 20, and a 20 and 18-year-old at home, and I'm watching it. And knowing, I mean, it's a wonderful thing when you see somebody who's 18 who knows exactly who they are and what they want. But it's it's I find that's more of an anomaly. Maybe that's my experience because I'm I'm in the music business, but uh, in my own home, it's an anomaly for it's 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 hard for somebody that age to know who they are, really who they are, even though people around them are probably can see things a little bit more clear than they can. Hmm. So just because the whole that it's, it's so so important knowing knowing who you are. Yeah. How do the best artists communicate that to you like in the process obviously toby you mentioned is is is, is a really good he, he's he's very discerning in yeah. terms of whether people know that or not but yeah. when you think back on the artists over the years who came in you're like oh that person has their thing together they know exactly who they are what are, what are they doing or communicating differently that that maybe somebody who is a little more 
wishy-washy is is putting up does that does that question make sense yeah i i think that they you know i mean i'll start here that what is always what's not good is when somebody says i don't know what i want but i know what i don't want that's always like uh uh-oh but when somebody comes to you and says, I, I have a very clear idea of in the next two to three years what I want to achieve, that usually perks your ears up. Like, okay, let's let's hear it. And, you know, depending on what they say, that's a great starting place when they can go and they can with, cl- with a lot of clarity go, I want to do this, this, and this, and this is how I, I would like to try to make that work. And I know I need this person, this person in my life in order to, I mean, I got to have collaboration for them to make this work. That usually is a great place to start from. Uh, Again, we've seen things succeed that didn't work that perfectly before, but it's, it's always wonderful uh, when, when you get that early. Having, having a vision for that. That's, that's really good. Um, I want to dive a little more into the nuts and bolts because you've, you've experienced this from a lot of angles, but what does it really take to launch a new artist in terms of maybe finances, maybe resources and sort of everything that has to happen behind the scenes. Like if you could just break it down as plainly as possible, what, what does it actually really take to to launch a new artist? Like on the national platform or a local or regional, I mean, is it like national? Yeah. I mean, you know, how, how, how you would view success, you know, success. I mean, nowadays that's, probably globally more than anything, but, um, but yeah, just even on a, on a regional or national level. Well, it's changed a ton. Uh, when we first started, I mean, it would be, I mean, if, if not to be so crass, but it would be anywhere from a hundred, a low end, a hundred to $400,000 to launch an artist back in the day. I and mean, that's, that's just putting dollar figures on it. I don't know if that's what you're looking for. Yeah, no, uh, that, that's helpful to hear. Uh, now it's not quite as much up front, but you better have the resources that if you get some wind behind you, you have stamina to keep keep going and keep coming back and keep coming back uh, to support the the uh, the way the market kind of allows you to kind of unfold, um, and that's important. I mean. I, you know, only a few times does that happen all in 12 months. Now it's, it's, you know, most artists now are like, you know, it might be, I don't know, it might take a little bit longer uh, in order for that to happen. So your stamina can be stretched out a little bit. That's what helps. Back in the day, you had to have the, you bet you had to have a bigger pot of money in a shorter period of time. It felt like. And nowadays it's more spread out. It's less upfront. You're, there's probably, you know, still a large, degree of experimentation, I would imagine, right? Trying stuff, throwing it out, seeing what sticks. If you give it space, if, I mean, if you're willing to give it space, and I think people are getting better and better at that. Like it was, there was, I think there was a moment in our business that we were really bad. The industry, not Christian industry, but the music industry was not good at giving things space to develop. It was like, well, if it doesn't happen pretty quick, you know, we, got, we, we can use our money in better ways. Mm. And I think you, they forgot, like, why did I sign this person in the first place? You know, and uh, it just takes time sometimes. It's, it's great when it's a, when it's a rocket ship launch, but uh, it tends to last longer when you have a more, more even keeled, like ascent. Yeah, that's well. And that's really good. I'm sure for people out there listening to hear that, you know, patience is very much a virtue in, in this business. And yeah. Things probably never happen as fast as you would think they would. Oh man, oh man! It, it, this business is like it's like this. You know, you know the set. This business is like wait, 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 wait. And it's, it's like what happened, you know? But that waiting feels like it takes a decade, you know? Yeah, that's that's so good, um, man. And I just want to stay there for a second. If you're if you're in a conversation with an artist who is in that season, as as I'm sure you are daily. What do you tell them? In the season of wondering what they should do or what, what season? Just in that season of wait, 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 wait. You know, I just try to give them examples, you know, of time. Like, like look, you know, what, what's an artist that you know that you love, that you feel like was successful? And if, I, if I'm lucky enough to know the story, 
uh, I try to give them that story and say, and, and more times than not, they think, well, you know, they probably moved to town and like in two years, it just boom. And it's like, no, that was actually an eight year run before they got there. They're like, what? I was like, yeah. And so if, if, if I'm able to relay the story, if I can't, I try to call people to try to get the story for the artist on how it happened, you know? And yeah, that works more times than not. It makes them feel like, okay, well maybe, maybe I can wait. Maybe it's, you know, it's not what it appears on the surface. Yeah. That's well said. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the brand management side of the company. Um, you mentioned you, you don't call them A and R. You call you said Brad and Jess are our brand managers. Yeah. Why do you call them that instead of A and R? Well, two things. We're a small company, and so you know we have to do a lot, and so uh, so we had to condense jobs. One, but two, there was a tension always that I felt in this business that when the A and R person would hand off the project to a marketing person, it was a it was very rarely a good handoff. It was max, usually a pretty terrible handoff, to be honest with you. And I hated that handoff. I hated watching that handoff. I hated seeing an artist get disappointed in that handoff. And so I always, I always told myself, there's got to be a better way to do this. But it was, it's hard to find people who really are pretty good A&R people and good at thinking holistically about the brand and how to, get the, you know, how to help the brand you know, in, on the platform start uh, sustain, move forward. So it's hard to find those people. So, you know, when we got smaller, it was just getting the right people and saying, Oh man, thank goodness. We don't have to do that, that awkward handoff anymore that we never figured out how to do. I'm sure some people have figured it out, but we never figured out how to do it. Great. Hmm. Well, in, in, in that lens, I mean, I think artists who are indie and, you know, young and early in their career. I mean, they kind of have to be all of that. And that can be an advantage in the beginning. Yeah. I think people are eager to hire a marketing agency or hire a social media team or sign with a label maybe before they're ready to. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think what happens a lot of the time is people haven't done it well enough on their own to even know how to work with a third party agency or company or label when that, when that happens. Mm -hmm. Uh, Do you see that to be the case at all? Yeah. I mean, there's a couple concepts in there where you just said one, one of them is uh, honestly, Seth, I don't think in 20 some odd years I've seen, and I think this is not just artists. I think this is usually people with ideas, you know, is, but in the music business, a lot of times artists are selling their, they're selling their ideas before they're proven. Mm. Are proven concepts and what happens is that's you're selling it cheaply mm. so you're always disappointed whether you can verbalize it or not when you're two years into the process you realize oh no i in your mind you think i sold my concept too cheaply and now i i regret it mm. uh, like it's like somebody going on to shark tank and then all of a sudden the thing is, um, you know, it gets on there and then it becomes this big, big, big business. They go, why did I sell that thing for a hundred thousand dollars? It's a $10 million company. What was I doing? And then all that disappointment turns into this negative energy that just stops your career. Mm. And the truth is, if you're not prepared at that moment to sell your company cheaply, wait and get the brand going. So you sell, you, so you sell your concept when it's a little bit more proven and you might not have the same regrets you had if you sell it too early. But then there's this balancing thing of to get into the national platform, sometimes you have to sell your ideas, you know, at least early, pretty cheap. It's the next time you sell it, what are you going to sell it for? And when I say sell it, I, I don't mean literally a transaction, but you know what I mean. But yeah, most, most, it people, out there. Yeah. Yeah, most people with ideas, they always are usually a little disappointed that they sold their ideas too cheaply and before they were proven concepts. Well, what are some ways nowadays that like define proven? What, what is, what does proven mean to an artist nowadays? Well, I mean, I mean, in the framework of what we're talking about, it, it's demand. It's, it's, it's demand from the consumers. It's demand from other people who want to invest in you. And all of a sudden, you know, the laws of supply and demand come into play and the price goes up and the, the you know, the, 
the passion, the, the resources, the inertia, the speed, uh, the energy, it all kind of speeds up, you know, uh, when you've got momentum and there's people who want to be a part of your momentum. So you wouldn't say it's as much about numbers or like hitting a certain threshold on Spotify or YouTube or anything like that. I think that play, that all plays into it, but the bigger concept is people showing up to your show, people, people not just passively listening to you, but people who are really active consumers of what you do. And you can tell, you can look now and see the difference between passive people and active people on your, who are engaging with you. And the passive people are no different than the, the fans that were in 1990. I mean, I mean, you're just looking for people who basically become like almost like unpaid employees. They just go around telling people, you're not going to believe what I just heard in this band. They, they, they are out there spreading, they are evangelizing you for free. Um, do, you, um, do you enjoy using tools like Next Big Sound at all? Yeah. I mean, I, I, mean, I struggle sometimes uh, getting out of it what I need. <laughs> Uh, but you know, you know, but I think I'm getting better at it. Um, but we have, we have one guy on staff who is, who I think is really good at it and, you know, trying to distill things out of it that are helpful because there's so much, there's so much you can, you can distill out of those numbers. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good. And, and again, just to repeat for people who aren't aware of it out there, nextbigsound.com, I've found to be a fairly good aggregator of that quote provenness or, or engagement, I guess. So, I mean, some of the things you have to take a little bit with a grain of salt. I mean, it, it'll put sometimes a new act right next to another one and, and put, say they're at literally at the same level of artist stage. And that's not really that true, yeah. but um, I find that tool to be useful. Are, are there other tools that you like as a, um, I guess, as a, as a talent scout to sort of verify and, 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 uh, aggregate data on on where an artist is yeah i think it's, we have one called chart metric and uh there's a, there's another one we use names escaping me right now they all they all kind of do the same thing but they, each one comes from a little bit of a different angle a different facet to their information you know and then we have all, we're, we're lucky because we have we get direct information from apple spotify youtube all that kind of stuff but on the indie level it's you know, it's, it's kind of looking at the same, we're all looking at the same stuff, you know, like people who aren't signed yet and who aren't really on the platforms. Gotcha. Well, no, that's good. Um, quickly, as we're, as we're wrapping up, before we dive into the lightning round, tell us about your, uh, is, is it fair to, is it called a sister company that handles fulfillment and, and vinyls and distribution? Yeah. Uh, a guy named Mike Kondo kind of started that, I don't know, I'm going to say four years ago. And it really kind of came out of, really relying K vinyl. Uh, and uh, we began to just start talking to a, a group of music lovers. And uh, we were hoping just to, to talk to them about, you know, music after we, you know, they were buying, you know, so a lot of the people who bought music on vinyl, what we learned is it's not about, it's, they're not audiophiles, they're, they're merch collectors and, uh, but they're fans. And so we uh, we just kind of would talk to them and get to know them, and it, it helped us market our other bands. But it's kind of morphed a little bit, Seth, into a uh, online merch fulfillment business, and uh, it's that's been great as well because you're learning about some consumer habits, and it's a tough business because it's it's a hundred percent about volume, but it's but it, but you get a lot of information uh, uh, about what people like pretty quickly, what people like and don't like, you know. So yeah. Are there kind of, and, and I'm sure this changes day to day, but are there are there trends now in terms of things that are really working? I mean, you mentioned vinyl. Um, are there other things that that are like fans are just loving and wanting more of nowadays? Uh, exclusivity. I mean, I mean, and that comes in the form of a a T-shirt that's only been a hundred of them made, a vinyl that's only a hundred of them made, a sweatband only been made. Uh, I mean just really exclusivity is what people really want. I mean, it's that whole Supreme culture, you know? Gotcha. Very, very cool. Well, um, are you ready for the lightning round? Yeah, man, let's do it. All right. Well, tell us the first artist you produced. Out of Eden. There you go. Something on your bucket list you haven't gotten to do yet. 
Uh, I want to spend the month of July in France following the Tour de France. That is a great goal. I love it. <laughs> uh, first song from Goatee that had some level of radio success. Lovely Day. Say that again. Uh, a lovely Day. It's a cover of a Bill Withers song. Uh, who was the artist? Out of Eden. Okay, there you go. What is the most beautiful place that you've ever been to? Man, it, it, can I, can I give, give it a tie? Sure. Uh, I really fell in love with the city of Vancouver um, in Canada. And I also love, I love, um, I love Paris. I know most Americans don't, I fell in love with Paris, you know? So I, those are two places that, that uh, I don't know. I kind of fell in love with them, both of them. Well, Paris is a beautiful place. It's, it's, uh, it's for me and my wife, we love France. My wife's from Sweden. So we definitely spent a lot of time over right. there in Europe, but, um, I think, yeah, the other parts of France to us have have stood out. Lyon, in particular. So That's, is that Southern Lyon? Lyon is uh, it's kind of right in the middle of the country. Okay. Not not on the not on the southern coast, which I've, I've not done the southern coast, but I've heard that's amazing down there. My hair is pretty down. I've never been there either. Yeah. Best food I've ever had was in Lyon, though. Oh really? Oh. Like foodie capital of the world, basically. I'm the skinniest fat man you'll ever meet, man. <laughs> Okay, last question. What was the first album you bought? That's easy. Uh, ABC by the Jackson 5. And why did you buy it? I saw them on a show. On, I was seven years old. There was a show in D.C. called Wonderama, and I turned it on on Sunday morning, and this group came out and sang this song and just rocked my world. And then the next day, I made my mom. I had some money saved up. Take me to the record store. And I bought that album, man, and I, I listened to it. I don't know how many times I listened to that record, man. I love it. Great, great answers. Well, Joey, I have learned a ton. I know our audience has as well, too. We are going to do our deep dive. If people are interested in this deep dive, we're going to be talking about what are you looking for from new artists, which is a question that I'm sure um, a ton of people have. People can access that at madeitinmusic.com. Go to the deep dive section, and we're going to dive into that. What are you looking for from new artists? So Joey, thank you so much for being on the Made It Music podcast today. Man, it's been a pleasure, Seth. I love, I love it, man. I love watching everything you guys do over there. Well, it's, it's, it's awesome. And uh, we're, we're, we're learning. We're, we're learning from people like you who are smart and have, have been doing it a lot longer than me. Now you're crushing it, buddy. You're doing great, man. So, I love it. Hey, really quick, uh, listeners, before we sign off, just want to make sure that you are aware of our Facebook group again. Head over to fullcirclemusic.com slash group to check it out. Head over there, request an invite. Again, it's the best way for our team to have a chance to see what you guys are up to. So make sure to go to fullcirclemusic.com slash group. Join in. Head over to madeitmusic.com where we are going to deep dive into what Joey Elwood is looking for from new artists. What's up? Thank you for watching the Made It in Music podcast season three. If you want to check out any of the other episodes from season three, click up here. And we talk in the show about these really cool deep dives with all this extra bonus content. And if you want access to all of those, click here.